You can put that where your seat is. I would love it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. I was worried about that. <laughs> Here. Oh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna bother her. That's saving. All right. Oh. <laughs> After this presentation, we'll have cookies and coffee and refreshments for you, so please stick around and socialize a bit. Uh, the presentation was made possible by some designated contributions from a few of our major donors, and I see a few of you here, and you know who you are, and I want to thank you uh, for making it possible uh, to bring George Philos here today. You'll also notice some Donation baskets on the tables. Uh, we are the most nonprofit of nonprofit organizations. <laughs> and as usual, your support is always gratefully appreciated. Uh, also, I'd like to announce that uh, George, uh, beyond being a, a fabulous attorney, is also an author and has written a book called Litigation as Spiritual Practice. What's so funny? <laughs> Litigators are spiritual people. So the book's available for $25, and it's over here on the table at the end of uh, uh, George's presentation. I'll be happy to autograph those. There's also a uh, tape, which is available for $10, called The Fundamentals of Prosperity with Prosperity Meditation. So not only does is he a spiritual attorney, he meditates. So. Um, for our guests who aren't familiar with us, uh, Compassion and Choices of Washington is the new organization created by the Unification of Compassion and Dying and End of Life Choices, which was formerly known as the Hemlock Society. Uh, for more information, there's a display table back there. We've got information about advanced directives. We've got the physician orders for life-sustaining treatment, the POLTS forms for you, um, all kinds of information back there. So please take a look at our display. Uh, those of you who came to Compassion and Choices from End of Life Choices, uh, or Hemlock, are very familiar with uh, meeting here because uh, End of Life Choices had an annual meeting every year. And our new organization's bylaws uh, will not require us to have an annual meeting to do the kind of business that you were familiar with at End of Life Choices, but we will be doing an annual presentation like this every year. And Hopefully the tradition will continue and we'll keep doing it here, where we're so welcome. Um, we're delighted to have George Philos here today, and we're going to be asking one of our younger supporters who is studying to be an attorney to introduce him for you. Um, and that is Amy Welch. Amy comes from a politically active family that embraced the value of diversity, choice, and civil liberties. She became a Hemlock member at the age of 18 and managed the newsletter for the Nebraska Hemlock Society while she was still a student. She moved to uh, Seattle several years ago and then became the office manager of the Hemlock Society of Washington. Uh, she left her position last year to enter law school at Seattle University. Uh, she continues to be active with Compassion and Choices and um, there is this idea that the only people involved in this movement for choice at the end of life are, are all elderly people, and that is not true. There are a lot of young people interested in this issue, and uh, Amy's here to tell you about that. Well, I don't know what to say about being um, young and in this movement. I, uh... I'm young and I'm in this movement. It happened. I guess that's all there is to say. Um, I was quite honored when I got this cute little email from Midge saying, would you please introduce our speaker? And that was the title. And so then I opened up the email and who read who it was for and kind of had to take a deep breath and think about whether or not I could remain composed enough to do so. So I'm quite honored to introduce our speaker. George Philos has been practicing law for almost 30 years and is considered a national expert in right-to-die cases. 
He's best known for his work as the lead attorney in the Terry Schiavo case, a multi-year struggle to end artificial feeding of a vegetative young woman. Prior to Schiavo, George argued the landmark case establishing an individual's constitutional right to refuse to refuse or have withdrawn unwanted medical treatment in the guardianship of Browning. That case decided by the Florida Supreme Court in 1990 has been cited by courts around the country, permitted the removal of unwanted feeding tubes without a court order, <coughs> also upholding the authority for surrogate decision making. The importance of that case is evidenced today by our thrust in patient education around identifying surrogate decision makers when writing advanced directives. George is the author of the nonfiction book, Litigation is Spiritual Practice, published in 2002 by Blue Dolphin Publishing. And from 1996 to 1998, he served as the chairman of the board for the Hospice of the Florida Suncoast, the largest nonprofit hospice in the world, and is a patient volunteer. He frequently lectures before lay and professional groups on the right to die and has led many meditation and professional workshops, professional growth workshops, and is a guest Sunday speaker at various churches. He created and teaches for the Florida Bar Association's accredited CLE courses, Meditation for Lawyers, and What You Need to Know About the Right to Die. As a third year law student, I'm very aware of the diligence and discipline that it takes to prepare such cases that propel fundamental questions of individual liberties into the spotlight. And I often wonder if attorneys are the unsung heroes in our work. It's with deep appreciation and understanding of his commitment to our issue that I invite you to join me in welcoming George Filos. Thank you, Amy, for that introduction, and thank you to uh, Compassion and Choices of Washington uh, for their invitation. Uh, to come from hot and humid, sunny Florida, uh, to cool and delicious and autumnal uh, Seattle. I want to especially thank uh, uh, Midge and uh, Rob uh, for inviting me. Uh, Rob picked me up from the airport yesterday, and we were talking, of course, about the... Let me put this down here. We were talking, of course, about the Shivo case. Uh, on the way to the hotel, and how the Shivo case became, it became such a, a hot point in what is described as the culture wars. And um, I think it was uh, Rob who mentioned uh, intelligent design, which, was the, which is the reincarnation of uh, creation. <coughs> Although I don't know if you can say reincarnation and creation <laughs> in, the same, in the same breath. So, <laughs> I, thought, I thought you might be interested in what the actual school kids have to say about questions of science and questions of the, of the Bible. These were actual questions asked of, I think, fourth and fifth graders about the natural sciences and uh, the Bible. And uh, they asked uh, uh, one young student, what's the difference between oxygen and hydrogen? And the answer was, well, Hydrogen is pure gin, oxygen is one part gin, one part water. <laughs> they, asked, they asked another student, well, what's wind? I said, well, wind is air, only it's pushy. <laughs> and they asked a, another one, well, what's a vacuum? And this young student answered, well, a vacuum's nothing but we give it a name so it knows that we know it's there. <laughs> but that's a real, that's a real thinker. That's a, that's a, that's a young student who has a, who has a future. Um, the questions about the, the, the Bible um, were, for instance, well, what, what's the name of Noah's wife? To which the answer was, well, that's Joan of Arc. <laughs> Or, what's the Sixth Commandment? And one student answered, well, thou shalt not admit adultery. <laughs> but that could have been asked during the Clinton years. We're not sure. And then another, another student said, well, 
St. Paul said it's good for men and women to live their lives together so they should enter into the, ho enter into the holy state of acrimony, <laughs> which is also known as monotony. <laughs> These are true answers, obviously. No one, no one could make this up. And lastly, one, one, young, uh, one young student said, the angel Gabriel came down to Mary and said, you're going to give birth to baby Jesus through your immaculate contraption. <laughs> So there is an intelligent uh, design in the universe, and I thought it's for young people. Um, I found through the Shivo case, you have to have a sense of humor. I mean, if you can't, if you can't laugh at times, and, and there were times, believe me, when I could not laugh, and that's a signal, a red light goes on, and I said, uh-oh. You're not doing too well if you've lost your sense of humor about the case. But it was such an important case on so many levels and for so many reasons that it was hard to bypass the, serious, the seriousness of it. Now, one thing, and oh, can, can all of you hear me without the mic? No, no, okay, I'm getting... I like to roll. Uh, okay, I'm technologically adept enough to take a mic out of a holder. That's good. Um, one thing that struck me so much was the public discourse about the Shivo case. And of course, one reason, one reason that it struck me so much is because as an attorney, I happened to know what the real facts were the case, of the case were. And it just amazed me again and again to listen to pundits on, on television and, and, and read newspaper articles and listen to accounts uh, about, about this case that were so divorced from reality. I remember watching one Sunday morning commentator with his temples bulging saying, well, how can they kill that poor woman? She's, she's never had a, a CAT scan. She's never had a brain scan. And of course, she had, she had a half dozen. She had a half dozen CAT scans. And in a, in a way, it saddened me. It really disheartened me. To, to see how that, how little truth was respected in the public discourse in this case. And what, what saddened me even more than that was how little truth seemed to be respected in the public discourse offered by the so-called faith-based and religious organizations. I was very saddened to hear priests and rabbis and representatives of faith-based organization talk about this case with either a deliberate misrepresentation of the facts or, or with so little interest in, in the truth or discovering the truth about this case. I was introduced as writing a book as litigation as spiritual practice. Spiritual practice means something to me. It means, it means something to most uh, Americans. We're a very spiritually oriented uh, culture, however that may manifest for, for each individual. And as a spiritual seeker, you don't just respect the truth, the truth is paramount. And some of our most deeply cherished and held beliefs have to be let go of when we're faced with the truth. And so it really, it bothered me and it saddened me in, in this context to see the, the debate um, about Terry Schiavo. And through my work in this area for now 
close to two decades from starting in the Browning case. And the Browning case was like a, in legal importance as far as the right to refuse medical treatment, it was, it, it took priority over Shivo. It was the precedent by which the courts were judging Shivo in the, uh, in the Florida, in the Florida case. But of course, in terms of the uh, publicity and, and, and impact uh, in this country and around the world, it was a, it was a smaller version, although it was controversial because before Browning in Florida, no nursing home patient could remove a feeding tube, whether competent or, or incapacitated in the state of Florida. And so, and so the Florida Supreme Court Browning in Browning proclaimed what we all now just believe to be our inherent right or ordinary right, that every competent individual has the right to chart the course of their own medical treatment. And that's a fundamental liberty that we all share. It's, in, it's inherent to who we are as individuals, as persons, to be able to make those very intimate and personal choices. And so the Florida Supreme Court in Browning went on to say, your prognosis is irrelevant to that right. Doesn't matter whether you're terminal or you're not terminal. It doesn't matter, you know, how that disease may progress or or not progress. Um, they, they put it in in this way: um, if you have a recoverable condition, if you have a condition that is recoverable, if you take this pill or have or have that very unintrusive treatment, it's your decision whether to take that pill or have that treatment because it's your body. And we, as a society, may disagree with your choice. Most everyone else might say, sure, I want that pill. I, I, I want to recover. I want to lead my life. I'll have that treatment. I'll have that. Uh, I'll take that pill. But for the one person who decides for whatever reason that that is not how they want to chart their own medical treatment, they have the right to, to say no. And the court also said that it doesn't matter what type of treatment we're talking about. You know, the cases, a number of the cases before Browning made this distinction between extraordinary treatment and ordinary treatment. Well, patients have the right to uh, refuse extraordinary or invasive treatment, but are, should be compelled to, to receive um, uh, ordinary or non-invasive treatment. But of course, What's extraordinary or, or ordinary depends upon the subjective judgment of that patient. So the Florida Supreme Court also said that the type, not only is the diagnosis irrelevant to the right, but also the type of treatment. And of course, the Florida Supreme Court, as every other court uh, in this country, has, has said and ruled that the artificial provision of nutrition and hydration is medical treatment that patients have a right to refuse. So it seems, when you listen to that, it, it sounds, well, yeah, that, that sounds right to me. That sounds acceptable. There's nothing particularly controversial about that. And then came along the Shifo case. Now, I have to tell you, the first time that Michael Schiavo walked into my office eight years ago, and this case was referred to me because of the Estelle Browning case, Michael walked into my office and I, and I, listened, I listened to the facts, and this was a removal of a feeding tube case, and there was no written living will, so the, the paramount issue would be the intent of the patient. Because this is a personal, individual liberty right the courts also say that when a patient has lost the ability to express his or her own medical treatment choice, that a surrogate has the right to effectuate the choice that the patient would want for himself or herself. And of course, a living will is the, is the best evidence of that, but oral, oral statements of the, of the loved one, lifestyle evidence can also come into play. So I, in talking to Michael Schiavo, I was listening to the facts and said there's this case isn't going to make any new law. 
There's nothing groundbreaking about this case. It's just applying the facts that we have and the law that we have um, to this case. And so maybe I was naive in a way, but I was surprised and became almost shocked at the ever increasing ratcheting up of, of public interest in this case and public debate and hysteria about what I thought was a relatively ordinary case about an ordinary choice. And that, that is, I came to conclude, part of the sign of the times. That in, in this area, many of you are, uh, have been involved in this area from a legal sense for many, many years. That the, the history of right to die, and by, and by that I mean with withdrawal or termination of uh, uh, unwanted medical treatment, started with the respirator cases in the 1970s, the, the Quinlan case, where the courts and legislatures finally proclaim what is also obvious, that the fact that there's a medical treatment or technology to prolong one's life does not mandate its use. Well, it, it took us a while as a society to jump over, jump over that hurdle. And then in the 80s came the, the feeding tube cases, which, which struck a deeper public chord and response. There was something about, about withholding food and water from a patient that made many more people uncomfortable. And there were some judicial decisions out there that said, no, that's not medical treatment, that's, uh, uh, that's comfort care, but those were on the trial level. Those were, those were reversed on appeal. So I thought, I thought this was a battle that had been fought, won, had been put to rest after the Browning case in Florida. The decision, I think, was issued in 1990, 1990 uh, 1991. There was about a year or so, year or two, where um, healthcare providers, hospitals, nursing homes, state authorities, state legislature had to bring the law and healthcare procedure into alignment with the, with the court's decision. But after that, it was a system that worked well or relatively, relatively well. And so the, one of the reasons I saw such opposition in the, in the Shivo case was a kind of ideological or political retrenchment or reactionary period in political life which we've seen in so many, uh, in so many different, uh, in so many different areas. And Another thing that is so disturbing about this to me was the right is the right of self determination is so fundamental to, not only in the not only in the field of medical treatment choice but throughout our, our entire society. The right of self-determination, that right of inherent liberty is such, um, is so fundamental to our core beliefs in this, in this country that I found it, I found it very disturbing um, that a right of that nature was being attacked so heavily in, in this case. And the Browning case, which was, controversial in many ways because it was it was groundbreaking there was a lot of resistance to a change uh, in the law generated a, a lot of uh, a lot of opposition and so I, I thought to myself I, I tried to reflect on some of the underlying bases of, of that opposition and I came to the conclusion or one one conclusion that our, our fear of death, our collective fear of death, was one of the underlying reasons that motivated the opposition in these type of cases. Now, if you, and if, but if you talk to the opponent and say, well, why are you opposing this? I'm sure they have, they're not going to come out and say, well, because I'm afraid of dying. 
um, you know, there would be other reasons, uh, other reasons uh, expressed. And it reminds me of a conversation I had with a, a fella I met who did a year's stint as a volunteer in Mother Teresa's hospice in Calcutta. And he, he had come back from the States, and I was very interested in talking to him because I have a, a, a long hospice background. I've been a hospice patient volunteer, or was for many, many years until they found, found out who I was, and then they said, oh, you ought to be on our board of directors, and I eventually uh, chaired the board of, of the largest nonprofit hospice uh, in the world. So I wanted to trade hospice stories and hospice experiences. And he said, well, Obviously, over in Calcutta, it was a low-tech hospice, but it was high in love. And he said something that knocked the socks off me. He told me that in the entire year he worked at the hospice, he did not encounter one patient or one family member of a patient who expressed the slightest fear about the impending death. And I said, wow. I contrasted that with my hospice experience and and the and and so much of the of the of the drama and uncertainty and fear surrounding the whole death process. And um, I, I, I began to wonder uh, and then, of course, I've also pondered it in, in terms of, of the Shiloh case and the hysteria surrounding Terry's death process. And I started asking myself questions. Well, why is that? Why, why is it that there is obviously such a huge cultural difference in how death was approached? And the first thing I said, well, there's, um, there's the religious aspect the predominant religious faith of those who were being served in Calcutta uh, was Hinduism. And of course, reincarnation is a prevalent belief in, in, uh, in Hinduism. But then I reflected on that a little bit, a little bit more and said, well, hold on. Um, surveys have been done in, in this country time and time again, and I think the statistics are 